would say that 50% of the people were against it, and uh, a lot of those that had made up their mind that it was coming and there was nothing they could do about it, they had to take what was offered to them, or it was be taken by eminent domain. And that was the hardest thing to take. And of course, you know, it was in the days of depression and people had a hard time getting money and they took what they could get. Located some 65 miles west of Boston lies one of the most enormous man-made projects in the world. It is known as the Quabbin Reservoir and supplies water to over 40 cities and towns in Massachusetts. On April 26, 1927, the state of Massachusetts approved an act to take the Swift River Valley and construct the Quabbin Reservoir. The project took over 20 years to complete and eliminated the towns of Enfield, Dana, Greenwich and Prescott. Over 2,500 people were forced to move. 36 miles of state highway were relocated and 7,561 bodies buried in 34 cemeteries were moved to a new cemetery built by the state. Today, the Quabbin Reservoir sits in the center of Massachusetts as a symbol of technology and as a memorial to those people who once called it home. How many years did it take to complete the construction of the reservoir? Actually, uh, the actual construction took about eight years. Actual construction started about 1930 and was finished in 1938. And at that point, they started filling the reservoir. It was filled first, I believe, in 1947. That was the first time we saw it Phil. Was that to capacity in 1947? To capacity, right, 412 billion gallons. Uh, our consumption was a lot lower at that point, so it didn't take that long to fill it. Why was this site chosen for the Quabbin Reservoir? Well, probably because of the unique characteristics. What you had here was, if you look straight out there, you'd see one river valley and another river valley coming in. Just by two impoundments, one over here to our right, and another on the other side of that hill, they could create a reservoir that, when it's full, holds 412 billion gallons of water. Uh, it's the largest anywhere in the Commonwealth and one of the largest, if not the largest, in the uh, country. That was the reason, one of the prime reason, I would suppose, why it was chosen. Do any of the homes that once were in the valley still stand? No, no. They were, uh, some of them were moved if the people that owned them wanted to move them. Others. Uh, those that were left in the valley were just demolished on the spot. All that's left actually is the old foundations, old stone foundations. I've always wanted to live on a farm and when we get the chance to move out to North Dana, I was glad. In fact, Ted had the truck all loaded with our furniture that night that I got laid off and I didn't even stop for supper. I got right up on top of the truck and we moved out to North Dana and uh, we never went back to Springfield to live again. Well, North Dana was the last town of the four in the northern part of what they called the uh, Munson Turnpike. That was Route 21 that runs from Springfield up through to Athol. And uh, uh, it was a good sized town. It was the largest manufacturing town in, in the Quabbin area and it was on a part of the Swift River, I think it was the east branch of the Swift River. They had to eliminate the towns completely by 1939, so everyone had to be out of there. And during that time, the uh, uh, Metropolitan uh, Commission was hiring people to go in there and cut the trees down. And most of those people were from the Boston area. They had no experience whatsoever. And uh, uh, the people, the uh, residents of the towns uh, had a hard time getting a job. And this is during the Depression. And the only work that we had actually, other than the town highway, was working on WPA projects. 
and one of the largest we had was graveling the roads, and uh, the second largest was hunting gypsy moths, going through the snow with snow up to your knees, up and down hill, painting the eggs on the trees. Do you find that many of those former residents are still bitter that the state took their land? I haven't really come in contact with that that much. I would imagine there, there would be hard feelings, sure. Uh, I mean, after all, hey, uh, they lived there and they had to move. Uh, I think if the situation were, were reversed and it was me, I'd be, I'd be, I'd, I'd be unhappy about it, sure. Uh, but the former residents that I've had contact with uh, don't seem to harbor any uh, intense hatred or anything, no. As a matter of fact, they seem very friendly. Did most people feel that the building of the Quabbin Reservoir would never come about? Did they think it was just a lot of talk? They did at first, I think. Uh, in the book of uh, Quabbin Lost Valley, uh, Mr. Hayes talks about uh, that sort of thing. He uh, surveyed a lot of the uh, notes that the state had about the people and their feelings. And at first, there was quite a bit of feeling against the idea. They fought like uh, the devil to get it stopped in the legislature, but they weren't strong enough. There's more votes in Boston than there is around here. Could you describe to us what the last day you spent in North Dana was like? Well, it was hard to take, I can tell you that, because I hated to leave there. The rest of the family, I guess, uh, they had their mind made up. And uh, for me, it was uh, a place that I always looked forward to, uh, the type of life that I always looked forward to. And uh, I knew that uh, where we were going, we were moving into West Brookfield, the whole family did. And uh, it wasn't so much of a farming town. And they had a small farm there, but uh, we had made arrangements with a real estate agent in West Brookfield to find us an apartment in the town itself. So we had left all that type of life that I like. Where does the majority of the water that feeds the Quabbin come from? Uh, it comes from the impoundment of the Swift River. It's roughly, it's a 186 square mile drainage area. Uh, it reaches as far north as, let's see, Orange, as far west as Wendell, uh, to the east it reaches as far east as Barry, and of course to the south, uh, right where we're standing here in Belchertown. Average depth overall in the reservoir is around 80 to 100 feet. At its deepest spot below the dam here, it's about 150 feet. When it's at capacity, it holds 412 billion gallons. Right now, it's holding a little over 402 billion. It services three towns uh, right here in this area. Uh, the town of Wilbraham, the city of Chicopee, and a portion of the town of South Hadley, known as South Hadley Fire District 1. Those are uh, supplied directly from Quabbin through the Chicopee Valley Aqueduct. Uh, the remainder of the water, uh, that is used for consumption flows east through the Quabbin Aqueduct. It's an underground aqueduct to Wachusett Reservoir. From Wachusett Reservoir, it then goes into the Wachusett Marlboro Tunnel, which connects into the tunnel system serving the metropolitan area. As far as communities in between that are serviced, you've got Lemonster, which gets a partial supply directly from Wachusett Reservoir, the town of Clinton, which also is supplied directly from Wachusett Reservoir. Uh, you've also got Marlboro, Southboro, and Framingham, which are tied into the tunnel system before it gets into the metropolitan area, which also get their water from. Uh, How much water is used each day? Uh, on the average, I think it's somewhere around 310. If you took the average, you know, the total amount that we would send down over the year that, the, uh, that everyone consumed and averaged it out, it would be about 310 million gallons. 
How is the water purified and what type of tests are performed on it? It's a natural treatment process. We don't, uh, we don't treat it at all. Uh, the only thing that is done to the water before it actually gets to the consumer is it's chlorinated for disinfection purposes. And in the metropolitan area, they do add fluoride. There isn't any added up here, only in the metropolitan area. And uh, they also use a small amount of caustic soda. That's for, to raise the pH. It's to protect the pipes from corrosion. I would think the size of the reservoir must have something to do with the cleanness of it. It, it, it does. It, it, it definitely does. It's, uh, it takes the water so long after it gets into the reservoir before it gets around to the outlet to go out at least a year. And uh, we've heard estimates up to several years. And that's enough time, you know, for a natural purification process. What kind of wildlife inhabit the area of the reservoir? Just about any, uh, any wildlife that's native to the area. Uh, one thing we're not sure of is uh, mountain lion. <laughs> we, we, we occasionally hear that there's one out there, but no one's ever verified it. But there are a lot of people that insist there's one out there somewhere. We don't really know. Uh, no, uh, any, any uh, wildlife that you would find native to the area, you'll find here, and uh, a lot of it. What was the reason for trying to get eagles back in this area? Just to establish the eagle again as a, a resident bird in the state. Uh, I've heard all kinds of figures, but I guess the best estimate is that it's been something like 100 years since it was a resident bird here in the state. And they're hoping that with this eagle hacking project that they've got going now, that that will come, that will be reestablished. It's the wintering area for eagles, although we pick up an occasional bird in other parts of the state. But the Quabbin's the, the major wintering area for the eagles. Uh, the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife instituted the latest wild turkey release in Quabbin. That's also spread, and we've had subsequent releases in the Berkshires. But uh, that's one of the animals you find in Quabbin that you're not apt to find in the immediate uh, vicinity, uh, things of that nature. Could you tell us a little bit more about the Eagle Project? The Eagle Hacking Project yeah. that we did this summer. Well, it was a great project. Everybody, of course, was uh, very interested in it. We had great media coverage. What happened was, well, it, it resulted from a conference back in 76 that I went to in uh, Wisconsin. And they talked there about hacking birds of prey. And hacking is an old falconer's term, which is a means of releasing birds to the wild so that they'll be able to take care of themselves. So we decided to hack two birds at Quabbin, and it took from 76 until this year to get the project off the ground. But once we got it going, it was great. We got two young birds from Michigan. They were six and a half weeks old. We had already built a tower with a couple of cages on top with uh, nests in. And we put the birds in, and they were held in such a way that from the day they were put in until the day they were released, they never saw a person. They were fed uh, from in back. They were observed through one-way glass, this type of thing. So they had no imprinting on humans. And we held them for an, about six and a half more weeks, seven weeks, and then we released them. And when we released them, it was kind of exciting. Uh, along the route, the male bird did get away from us. He squeezed out through the bars. But we trapped them again and got them back. So then we immediately put all their markers on. We put a transmitter on the tail, 
and we put potato markers, their wing markers, and we also put on the uh, standard Fish and Wildlife Service aluminum leg band. And then we let the birds go. And the male bird had, that had escaped, he was a good, strong flyer. Uh, he just flew off into a pine tree and perched. The female bird went down in the water, and we had to fish her out. And we brought her back, dried her off, and let her go again. And that time she flew a lot better. And she perched in the tree there on the shore for three days. And then she made really her first real flight. One afternoon she flew up to Mount Snow in Vermont. And she stayed there overnight. And we went back a couple of days later with a plane and picked up the signal. And she was up in Russell, Ontario, uh, right outside of uh, Ottawa. And then we couldn't afford to go back there too far. But we did go once. and. Uh, she had gone beyond, so she's up in northern Canada someplace. Hopefully, some one of the Fish and Wildlife Service people that are working on other projects will pick her signal up, or she may come back to Coabin and we'll pick her up. We're hoping she'll be back, of course. New York State has been involved in this program for six years, and they've had 100% success. Uh, they started it in 76, and the eagle doesn't breed until he's somewhere between three and a half to five and a half years old, reaches maturity. And their first two birds that they hacked in 1976 came back in 1980, built a nest and raised young ones. So, you know, it does work. In between times, the birds may come and go from the area because they're imprinted for this as a home base. When did you first become interested in the wildlife of the Quabbin Reservoir? When I got out of the service in 1954, I started hiking the Quabbin. Uh, I did a lot of hiking, and of course, that was an obvious place to hike. It was so nice. So, in the early 50s. How do you go about photographing the many types of wildlife at the Quab? Do you have a certain way of doing it? Not really, except to be willing to spend a lot of time sitting and waiting. Uh, I have to build a good blind to, to stay in, and I have to do some research in order to determine where I should build the blind, find out where there's a good working area for some certain species and put in a good blind and then be willing to get in there early in the morning and sit all day, which I don't like. I'd rather be hiking, but you don't get good pictures that way. Are there any animals at the Quab in which have escaped you, which you haven't been able to photograph? Well, of course, the one that uh, is the big one that's never been really pinned down is the mountain lion. I saw one in 1968. And a biologist from the university had a good look at one in 1969. Since then, we've had sporadic reports. But now last summer and this past summer and the one before, uh, we had some very good reports from very knowledgeable people. Uh, one fellow that I know very well is a woodcutter in there. And he's in there every day cutting. And he sees deer. He sees bobcats. He sees fishers. He sees the coyotes. He doesn't get excited. Uh, and he was uh, much a scoffer about mountain lions until he saw the first one, and now he has seen two. And the last one he saw, I think it was in August, and he watched it for a full five minutes. And there's no question it was a mountain lion. No question in my mind whatsoever. The question is the origin of the animal. Is it a wild, truly wild mountain lion, or did you have it for a pet? And when it started to grow up, you got tired of it, and you decided to dump it, and the best place to dump it would be Quabbin. That could be the origin of the animals. I'm not saying that. But we do certainly have an occasional mountain lion, and I'd love to get a picture of one. What type of public recreation facilities are there at the Quabbin? OK. Uh, there is a boating program here, which, but it is only in connection with fishing. Now, that includes. Uh, launching a private boat, which is allowed from three boat launching areas. Uh, also at those three areas, you can rent a boat and motor, again, only for fishing purposes, or uh, you can fish from the shore at those locations. As far as where we are here, down at the south end of the reservation, that's open to the general public year round. Uh, there are picnic tables scattered throughout the reservation here. Uh, there are several miles of hiking trails within the reservation which they can also use. Do you find that many people abuse the privileges which they have at the Quab, which is unique compared to most reservoirs? Well, that's a hard question to answer. I don't think there are really that many that do. Uh, I would say the majority of people understand it and respect it. 
people are. Even if they don't understand it, I'd say they respect it. Uh, the problem is that the minority that does abuse it, of course, make themselves more visible, and they do the damage. But I'd say the majority of people do not. Do you have any problems with people hunting illegally? Up in, in the Quabbin? Yeah. Well, we do. It's, uh, as you say, that's really not our job. Uh, we have a law enforcement branch uh, that it's, it's not in with us, it's separate. But they do our law enforcement work, and it's, it's their job to take care of this. And it becomes a problem, especially like this week, which is deer hunting season. Uh, the rest of the year, uh, hunting in there is pretty much minimal. But during the, during the deer season, it's just, uh, it's like a magnet. It draws people, they want to get in there to hunt. They think it's just the best place in the world. Do any of the former residents of the four towns come back here to visit what once was their home? Very often, very often. Uh, and we do, uh, we do offer a special courtesy to them that we don't to other people in that if they are a former resident of one of the towns, we grant them permission to go in and drive down to their former, uh, you know, to their former home. Uh, that's a privilege which, of course, we don't grant to the general public because, of course, they, uh, <laughs> it would just be too many people in there. As far as the general public is concerned, you've got to walk in, but that is a privilege that we afford to them. It must be an emotional experience, though, for them to come back, if say, once a year or however often. Oh, I, I think it definitely is, yeah. Uh, Roger Lonergan, he's our super. He said once he's not sure whether they feel better or worse afterwards, you know. I mean, it, it does have to be an emotional experience looking at, after all, you're looking at your home and it isn't there anymore. Do you ever go back to the area that oh, once was North Dana? Every year, only that uh, where we last lived, uh, down in the town itself, it's covered with 90 feet of water. So you can imagine what it's like. Is, I would think that would be an emotional experience going. going it is back. for a lot of people, but I enjoy going down there. It doesn't bother me as far as that's concerned. Uh, I can show you pictures of uh, before and after of the farm itself. And uh, if you're down there now, you wouldn't recognize any of it. All there is left is the steps, stone steps that go up to where the lawn was. And that's where we have our pictures taken now. And that's the only thing we can recognize of the uh, old farm. So we go up to where my husband lived. And of course, where I lived, I couldn't go back if I wanted to. The nearest I've gotten <clears throat> was a year ago when Ralph and B. Barrows drove to a point where we ate our lunch. And I could, I could look and I said, well, about two miles from here is my home. Underwater now? Yes, definitely. Quite a bit of water. It seems that in recent, say, the past six months or so, or even the past year, that the Quabbin has received a great deal of publicity. Uh, why do you think this is? I think part of it is because finally, and I say finally because I'm glad it's happened, people have started to realize that there's a little more to it than just going to that tap and turning it on and the water's going to come out. I think finally they're realizing that nothing is bottomless that there is an end to it. I think that's part of the reason. They're finally becoming conscious that water is a precious resource and it has to be conserved, taken care of. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's only one that's more vital and that's the air we breathe. That I think is the main reason. Where people years ago didn't know where Quabbin was. I mean, you ask people in Boston where their water comes from, they say it comes out of a faucet out on 128. You know, they don't realize. But I think it slowly is changing now, it's escalating. There have been several movies made, several books, recent books written, music being composed about Quabbin. Uh, it's, it's changing. And this could be good or bad, two-edged sword. Do you think today the state could get away with abolishing four towns to build a reservoir of that size? No. No, because there's more help around for people in that category of uh, troubles. Uh, they could get more help than they could back th in those days. Nobody knew how to organize protests. And I, I'm pretty sure that the protests that are 
the range now uh, are a lot stronger than they had then. We only had one representative that I can see from what I've read that was trying to help the people down there, but he didn't have enough votes. All the votes were right in Boston. It's obvious to me that, sure, Boston had other reservoirs, local reservoirs, the Sudbury Reservoir and all that business that became so polluted that they were no longer usable for drinking water. Uh, so to me, why let your reservoirs get that polluted? I mean, that, I'm not blaming anybody because that's a way of life or has been. Now I think we're starting to realize that water is a precious commodity and I don't think that would happen again. But it's a shame that it did happen because Quabbin would not probably have had to have been built. Do you think that the Quabbin will look much different than it does today, say in 20 or 30 years from now? Well, I hope not. Uh, there are uh, special interest groups that pick at it, that want to open it up for their own particular thing. So far, the MDC has done a super job controlling the reservoir. As you've been there, it's just, it's beautiful. It's well controlled, and there's something there now for everyone. I don't think it should be changed a bit. The formula is working beautifully. Leave it like that. The reservoir is open, I think, 60-some percent of it to fishermen, shoreline and water surface. Uh, so they have plenty of fishing area. And yet, it's wild enough with the limited access. You can go in and hike. Uh, you can lose yourself in there as far as other people are concerned. You have a chance to see the beavers. You have a chance to see deer. You have a chance to see eagles. It's just super. And I very much hope, and I'll fight to keep it that way, uh, because it's so great, and we don't have to take anything away from anybody. Just keep it as is. Don't change anything. And I hope that it doesn't change in 20 or 30 years. If someone told you, you could spend one last day at Quab <laughs> and that's it. How would you spend that time? <laughs> well, I guess, I guess I would like to spend it in the wintertime in a blind watching eagles. I've had a thing about eagles for 30 years, and that would probably be it. Yeah, a good blind watching eagles. All in all, it was, a, it was a nice little town. The people were all very friendly. And uh, once they knew you, they'd do anything for you. And uh, it's something I always wanted, to get out in the open air. Oh, we always lived in a city, and uh, I, I loved the farm. I'd go back there now if I had the opportunity. <laughs>